and welcome to Career Explorations. My name is Donna Gerson and I'm the Associate Dean of the Career Strategies Office here at Drexel University Thomas R. Klein School of Law. Tonight's program is all about careers in environmental law and we have a fabulous alumni panel to speak to you about their various career journeys. Uh, this program is being recorded and we encourage you to ask questions through the chat we're leaving time at the end to have some Q&A with you. So please think about questions to ask our panelists and also to our uh, the Dean, um, Alex Geisinger. And it is my great pleasure to introduce Alex Geisinger, who is the Associate Dean for Faculty Development and Research and a Professor of Law here at Drexel University Klein School of Law. He teaches a number of courses, including environmental law, has won teaching awards, and has, won, and has written extensively about a variety of issues. So it is my pleasure to introduce you and to lead off and moderate this discussion. Thanks, Donna. Hey, everybody. Welcome back from break, um, including my environmental law class, Hale. Um, so we have some uh, wonderful panelists, four of them, who are all graduates of the law school. Um, and they're all uh, practicing environmental law in, uh, in different ways. So uh, I'm going to get out of the way, and I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. And then uh, after they introduce themselves, to just talk a little bit about what kind of law they practice and to give you all a sense of what a day in the life looks like Hi everyone, my name is Laura Antonucci. I graduated from Drexel in 2019. I was an accelerated two-year student. Um, I am currently working at the Pennsylvania Office of Consumer Advocate, which is um, under the Pennsylvania Office of Attorney General, and I am practicing public utility law. Thanks, Laura. Um, so energy law, right, public utility law is uh, di directly related to environmental law and these days a growing field. So um, uh, if you have questions about it, please uh, talk with Laura. Uh, so Diana, can you introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Diana Silva. I'm a partner at the law firm Mako Gold Catcher and Fox which is um, an environmental boutique firm. And when I say boutique, I guess we're not that boutique anymore. We have about 32 environmental lawyers. Um, all we do is environmental law. We're based in Philadelphia, but we do work all over the country and the world. Um, and our firm also has three in-house uh, environmental engineers that work for the firm. And so we sort of have a very unique specialty practice. Um, there's not many other folks like us out there and have been practicing at my firm since I graduated from Drexel and started my career there and, you know, was a junior associate, senior associate, partner, and so I'm sort of a lifer, which is atypical for what some of the stories people are going to talk about here. I've, I've sort of only known one thing, but happy to share my experience about my firm and a very diverse client base. And I know all the other panelists because I talked to them when they were students uh, or in practice now, which, which is very fun. So thanks, Alex. Hey. So, uh, and I don't know if this is still right, Diana, you can correct me, but I think is Manco now the largest boutique environmental law firm in the country? Yeah, that's why I say when we say we're a boutique, I'm like, are we really a boutique anymore? Um, yeah, so we're the largest um, specialty practice environmental law firm in the country. Um, you know, there's others out there, one of which was um, Professor Geisinger's former former life, but that that's not really only environmental law anymore. So yeah, we're the largest environmental boutique in the, in the country. All right, so we're moving on. Thank you, Diana. Um, so, Erin. Uh, okay. Hi. Um, hi, everyone. So, my name is Erin Cosgrove. I graduated in 2017, and I graduated with a dual degree. So, I got my JD as well as my Master's of Science in Public Policy, um, and I work in the nonprofit sector. Um, my newest job, I don't really wear my attorney hat that often, but I could say that I do actually uh, utility law, just like Laura. So, um, I can talk about Act 129 and energy efficiency programs, um, but yeah, so that is my, um, but uh, so yeah, I do nonprofit. It's a Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnerships is what we're called, and we are technically a regional energy efficiency organization. So I help 
states in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic Mid -Atlantic implement their carbon policies and decarbonization policies. Um, so I do utility sector regulation mainly, but also building codes. Um, and I come from water um, in a previous life. Um, I was at the Delaware River Keeper Network, and then I actually was just at a trade association called the Energy Efficiency Alliance. And I can talk about how that looks a little bit different too um, when we get into it. Thanks, Erin. Yeah, and I was going to actually point out too that Erin did get the uh, the master's in public policy, and obviously environmental law and public policy are really very closely uh, interconnected. So if you have any questions on that, make sure to talk with Erin about it. And then finally, Bobby, go for it. Everybody, I uh, graduated in 2013, spent about six years at the Department of Environmental Protection started in Harrisburg, uh, went to the Philadelphia regional office for a couple of years and then back to Harrisburg. And then in December of 2019, I joined a Fox Rothschild environmental practice group. So now I specialize in a little bit of everything regarding you know, litigation, compliance, and permitting. While I was at DEP, I practiced mostly in the um, brownfields and remediation uh, division, which you might um, be familiar with under the term uh, Superfund, which is a comprehensive something, something, something law that's used by the state and federal governments to address, you know, kind of legacy contamination at old industrial sites and mom and pop gas stations alike. Thank you, Bobby. Yeah, and uh, and Bobby's also doing work in a uh, in an emerging area of environmental law on um, on uh, fluorinated chemicals. Will ask him to talk about that um, a little bit moving forward as well. I know he's going to talk to my environmental law class about it next week. All right, so um, so uh, thank you everyone for introducing yourself. I am now truly going to get out of the way. I'm going to ask you guys to just sort of talk about a day in the life and the type of law you practice. And my my own interest is I'd like you to try and explain a little bit about sort of you know, what the practice is like, right? I think people come sort of with an assumption that environmental law is um, is about hugging trees and they don't realize how technical um, it can be. So I will leave it to you to explain it in your own words. Um, so take it away, maybe start with the same group. Go. So I'll start. So I think when I go to cocktail parties and um, people ask me what I do for a living, I said, oh, I, I do environmental law. The first reaction is, oh, that's so great. And I want to say it is so great, but it's not um, what people think it is. So, you know, most of us who and we'll have a, a good sort of panoply of people here had a different experience. Um, private practice environmental law is typically representing a regulated entity. And what I mean by that is somebody who has an environmental condition, needs a permit, wants to build something that has an environmental component. No, my clients range from mom and pop gas station owners like um, Bobby sh said to multi-billion dollar Fortune 50 companies that you can all think of the names of that, you know, drive industry and products we all buy and use in our homes and electric generation units and, you know, utilities. I do a lot of PC work too. So I think um, in private practice, what you'll find is most of us who do private practice environmental law are rep representing an entity that is regulated either by the local state DEP, by the EPA, by you know, the uh, European Union's Council on Economic, or, I'm sorry, Environmental Issues, or some regulatory issue, whether it's in, um, I need a permit because I want to build my widget, or um, I have a litigation matter from a group of citizens that's saying what my client's you know, property or industry is doing is harming them in some ways. And so I think most people think environmental law is oh, we're going to save the Peregrine Falcon. I do that. I had a Peregrine Falcon case last year and we moved a building for them. But I think most people think um, it's more of, you know, hugging trees and things. And there's definitely part of that, the non, you know, the nonprofit environmental sector, um, which some of us have worked with in the past, definitely does that and has more policy oriented goals. They bring litigation to, um, you know, achieve a change in, in a, a compliance related industry, but most private practice environmental practitioners like Bobby and me, what we do is represent a client. Most of them need a permit. Most of them are doing something and we're trying to assist them comply with the law and ensure compliance. And so when people say, oh, great, I say, yep, that's exactly right. 
I am helping our clients comply with the law, move forward, change, you know, greening of industry and the like. But in the end, my client may be, for example, no one thinks about QVC or the home shopping network. We represent them. Why would we represent them? Well, when people don't buy like, you know, Jane Fonda sweatpants, they got to get thrown away somewhere. Well, that's a waste issue. They can never have the power go off. Well, they have their own power plant. So there's a lot of industries you would never think have environmental issues that do. Um, and so it's really fun. The thing I like about my job is I represent the big companies you can imagine that have waste issues, chemical issues, energy issues. Then I represent all these different companies that you would never think have environmental issues and we, they need help on some very unique issue. CHOP, hospitals, like there's lots of environmental issues across industries that no one ever really thinks about until you're in the industry. And that's part of the fun of my job. So I'll give it to somebody else. <laughs> Yeah, someone. I'll uh, go ahead, Bobby. Oh, sorry, sorry, Aaron. I'll echo that what Diana said. Um, most of what we do is, you know, interpret the law for our regulate regulated client, and they want to follow the law. And they, you know, I, I think there's this perception that you know you work for private companies and you help companies avoid liability for spills and things like that. And that's not really been my experience. Most of their questions involve, hey, DEP or EPA came out with this new law, or they're planning to come out with a new law. How does that impact me? And here's what my business looks like, or here's this real estate that I plan on purchasing, right? Like, what am I getting myself into? Um, I'll also add from, from my time at DEP, your day really is not that dissimilar. It's just from the other side of the table, right? It's you have DEP um, compliance permit writers, right? People who review the permit say, okay, this person's coming in and they need a new permit or they want a new permit. Here's what their facility looks like. You know, how do we fit them into this criteria? Or um in my last few years, it was, it was a little bit different in the sense that we were writing the regulations uh, and updating the regulations for storage tanks or for uh, PFAS and PFOA standards, which haven't come out yet. But you know, we, um, in that sense, we uh, think about you know what the regulations currently say, and then we get uh, comments from the public and try to incorporate that and take that into account in terms of like, what should the standard be, right? Should it be too high? Should it be, is it too high? Is it too low? Who's it going to impact? Is it going to be protective enough for human health and the environment? And then ultimately, you know, you finalize a regulatory package and then see if it's gonna get appealed and then defend it in court. Yeah, Laura, why don't you take it? And then uh, we'll let Aaron do cleanup. So um, as I mentioned before, I practice public utility law. Um, so I don't practice environmental law, um, even though there are environmental concerns and issues that pop up in almost every proceeding I'm involved in. But um, public utility law is um, the regulation by the state and federal government of the business activities of your major utilities um, that provide electricity, water, natural gas, um, and so the office that I work for, um, the Office of Consumer Advocate, we represent the interests of all of the consumers in Pennsylvania before the Pennsylvania Public Utility Commission and before FERC, which is the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission um, located down in DC. And um, the point of the regulation is to ensure that these um, essential services are provided to customers in a safe, reliable, efficient, um, and adequate and affordable um, manner. And so um, our major cases, um, the ones that seem to take up uh, most of our time are the base rate cases where um, the utility uh, requests from the commission an increase in the annual revenues it's um, allowed to collect from customers through the rates that it charges. Um, and so, Typically through those cases, we have rounds of interrogatories. Um, we have uh, rounds of written testimony where we have experts um, that provide our um, position in the case. And then there's hearings, um, an administrative law judge makes a recommended decision. 
and then the Public Utility Commission will um, make a decision based off of that. And um, most of our proceedings kind of follow in that same litigation um, timeline. But um, we're also involved in a lot of complaint proceedings where um, usually a utility is accused of violating the Public Utility Code. Um, and we represent um, consumers in those proceedings. Um, if, if, if it affects consumers or it could potentially affect consumers, the outcome of that complaint proceeding. And um, utilities also, um, they're usually required to submit plans um, for approval by the commission. And the plans can range from long-term infrastructure um, improvement um, plans where the utilities lay out for five years. Um, we need to improve these areas of our infrastructure and it's gonna cost this much over the five years. Um, also, as uh, Aaron mentioned, the energy efficiency and conservation plans that your major electric utilities need to submit here in Pennsylvania. Um, we represent the interests of consumers. Um, it's a very collaborative process, which is nice. Um, there's a lot of settlement conferences to try and perfect a plan and everybody kind of gets to make proposals and take something away from it. So, um, so we represent the interest of consumers to make sure that they're getting a lot out of the plan, um, as much out of the programs that are proposed as possible so that they can cut down on the amount of electricity that they use. Um, there's also universal service programs um, where we need to figure out how the, um, um, the most vulnerable of us uh, that struggle to pay their utility bills are able to keep their, their lights on, their water provided, um, and we figure out how that's gonna be paid for as well um, under public utility law. So um, it's a very interesting area of law. It's always changing. Um, there's always new statutes for the uh, commission to, um, to uh, you know, create regulations for. And uh, I, I just think it's a very fascinating area of law and it's very important too, um, because if you think about like Texas two months ago, um, people were without electricity and gas and water and it was a total disaster. So. Um, if you have further questions about this area of law, please reach out to me. I, I love talking about it. So I can pick up from there because I'm equally as dorky about utility law now. Um, and actually, I used to kind of do what Laura in my previous job when I represented a trade association, I actually represented energy efficiency implementers. So I got to represent businesses. But what they did was they helped lower energy usage, which does connect to environment for me. Um, and when you lower energy usage, you lower utility emissions, which lowers carbon. Um, and so that's how, that's that circle for me and while, why I now work in the utility sector mainly. Um, but, um, but I got to represent them in those Act 129 proceedings. So I got to do a lot of what Laura did um, in my previous position. I loved it. And I think it's a really great way to see how all different sides can come to the table to find an answer to an issue. Because as she said in the settlement proceedings, there's a lot of collaboration. Um, it's a lot of people throwing ideas around, trying to figure out new and innovative, innovative ways to solve things. Because um, yeah, so what I do now, um, I guess I want to give a little primer when I talk about building decarbonization and energy efficiency, because not too many people know what those terms mean. Um, and so what that means is lowering the amount of energy that you use in your home. Um, and that might not be that exciting for people also because you're all renters, so it might not even matter to you. Um, but the amount of energy that you use determines your power bill, also determines how much energy the utilities need to make every year. And that's like projected out into an analysis and that runs our power grid. And that is both natural, that's natural gas, coal, and other, what I'm gonna call dirty fuels on this call, but don't quote me on that in the outside world. Um, but I work to eliminate, to help align utilities, regulators, and businesses and advocates on a way to lower the carbon emissions of utilities kind of slash your homes, which is building decarbonization. And that includes putting like solar panels on your home and includes something called heat pumps, um, which not that many people heard of, but it's just electrifying heat. Um, so, so that's a little background on what I do. And I'm gonna kind of just go through my day actually, because it's, 
I, what I used to do was more kind of a legal aspect. Like I said, when I represented a trade association, but now for a nonprofit helping with implementation of policies, my day changes very often. And I get to work on a lot of really exciting stuff. Um, so this morning I kicked my day off with the re release of a building electrification report in New Jersey, where I got to suggest policies that they could adopt from the report at all different levels of government. Um, I finished an application for a conference where I got to talk about ways that utilities can implement decarbonization policies into their business models, which is how you get them to invest in this technology. Um, I then went to a meeting with advocates from Connecticut where I got to help them figure out how to invest in weatherization programs that focus on low income advocates. And finally, I am working on a comment for Maine energy efficiency programs. And I don't know if anyone knows about Maine because that's what I do now, um, but they have a huge push for electrification under their new governor and she's really great. And they are actually like leading the transformation to clean energy. Um, and so we're giving them suggestions and I get to work with a team of 10 people on this comment and I'm kind of the policy voice for my organization. So that's what I get to do in a day. So uh, are we taking questions in the comments now all? Donna, why don't you? Uh, yeah, so if you have questions, start throwing them out there for us. I'm going to keep people working through some other stuff. Um, this one, I think, is is primarily for um, our 1Ls and, uh, and also for um, prospective students. But I'd like if the panelists uh, can sort of talk a little bit about the courses that they took when they were in law school. Um, and particularly, though not solely, I'd like you also to talk about, because we do a lot of experiential education, how experiential education sort of fit into the coursework you did um, to get you where you are and what you found helpful and what you didn't. I would say administrative law, having a fundamental grasp of how that works. Um, environmental law is definitely important. Um, but what you end up dealing with on the day to day can just be really fundamentally different than what you actually get a chance to talk about in class. So administrative law really gives you that foundation to think about you know, laws, regulations, guidance documents, and then most importantly, explain it in a way that someone else is gonna be able to understand. And I think that's really the key to working in, as a lawyer in an environment in the administrative law field. Um, so I took admin law, I took a bunch of writing courses to try to improve my writing. And um, I did not anticipate being a litigator. So I uh, did not take any pretrial ad or anything like that. <laughs> but what I did take was an entrepreneurial law clinic. And that wouldn't seem to be helpful on the surface, but what it did do was, you know, put me in a room with a client, try to understand the client's needs, and then turn that into a useful recommendation, right? Like, it's one thing to be able to write a legal memo and say, okay, here's what the law says. Um, it's another thing to be able to take that and turn it into a product that the client can understand and then apply it to their own business or their own circumstances. And I think that's um, where experiential learning comes in. It's, it's learning that and practicing that conversation with the client. And so I think any experience and any, especially as a student, regardless of the, of the, the content, right? Regardless of the substance, whether it's environmental law or immigration law or uh, business law, just practicing having that conversation with the client and that back and forth is extremely helpful. Yeah, I mean, there is a panoply of, of classes in sort of the environmental and administrative and energy law sector that the law school offers. Um, I teach one of them. So some of some of the fellow panelists were in my class. Um, so I teach it's a, it's called toxic torts, which is really toxic torts, but it's an environmental litigation class where we use uh, examples from our real cases, my real cases and change the names. Um, and you guys you know, argue and, and do oral arguments in a brief and sort of feel what it's like to do environmental litigation from both plaintiff side and, and defense side. Um, and one of the questions that was asked um, by um, 
in by one of the one of the students or, or prospective students on this call is what to take advantage of while at Drexel and in Philadelphia if you want to do environmental law. Um, almost all of the panelists, I think, either as a student or in real practice, real life, are members of something called the Delaware Valley Environmental in a Court. Um, and I, out, Professor Geisinger is a member, or lots of people are members. And so it's um, nobody knows what INSA courts are. Um, the Drexel Law has one that we just started last year I'm on, on the board of. But the Environmental Court is um, basically a, a, a social and <laughs> education and professional organization amongst all the environmental lawyers in the Philadelphia region and elsewhere. Um, you're, it's free if you want to be a member as a student. And you, you basically will meet every single environmental practitioner in the sort of Philadelphia region in that organization um, across the board. People at DEP, people at EPA, people in nonprofits, people in the public sector. Um, people in my firm, lots of people in my firm, people at Bobby's firm. <laughs> so um, it's it's great. And um, there's also a another thing that me and Bobby have been on the panel before. There's a, a yearly environmental law forum in Pennsylvania called the Pennsylvania Environmental Law Forum. Again, every single environmental practitioner in the state of Pennsylvania is a member of that and goes to it. And so it's fun because you, you'll get to meet everyone. And again, students can go to that. Um, I was also a member of the, the New Jersey to any, anybody who wants to practice across the river, because I do a lot of that. There's a, ver a similar environmental in a court in New Jersey called the Pollock Environmental Law Court that I was a member of for almost 10 years. Um, oh, look at that. They're putting up in the court. Um, and so it's, um, it's really great. And as a student, there's really no heavy lifting. It's an amazing opportunity to network. Um, I wish I had done it as a student. I don't think I knew about it as a student. So I now pass on the Bible. Um, the other thing I would say is, you know, if you have interest in environmental law, there's lots of opportunities for co-ops um, that are in, in the environmental field. I didn't come to law school with a burning passion to do environmental law. Some of my panelists will say they did. I sort of figured it out as I went along. And so I co-opt in-house at Exelon, which is the parent company for Pico in my third year. At that point, I knew I was gonna practice at my firm. And so I wanted to see what it was like from the client perspective. And I did that and their clients still, their client of my firm before and now. And so that's really great. I know Bobby got, and he could talk about this, um, got his position at DEP, was, was also an intern at DEP through the co-op or through the summer program. And I think Aaron and others were too. So there's lots of experiential learning opportunities, both in private practice and nonprofits, um, the Delaware Riverkeeper Network, which Aaron was with, with the Clean Air Council or Conservation Law Foundation. There's tons of opportunities as a student, you know, world's your oyster. If you want to go do that, and you should definitely try it out and see what life is like. There's one question there about whether a science background is important, how important it is to practicing environmental law. <laughs> um, it's helpful, not essential. I was a city planner. I knew how to read a drawing. That was about as close to science as I got. That said, there's people who work in my firm who were chemists or her engineers beforehand. It is a plus. It's not a requirement. Um, it does help you understand what you're looking at, but frankly, after a couple of years in this practice, I, I pretend to be a hydrogeologist. I know 95% of that at this point. Um, and I think Bobby and others would say the same thing. And Alex is laughing because I'm sure he pretends to be a hydrogeologist too. So you figure it out, it's helpful, but it's not a essential prerequisite. It's definitely a plus on your resume though, if you're in this field. Yeah, I was a Spanish major, if that helps. So no, um, but to what Diana said, uh, you just, sit and have a conversation with a hydrogeologist for long enough. And I like to think of it as like a, the su like sunburn on my brain, like the first couple conversations, I had no clue what they were saying and my brain really hurt, but then you just keep doing it, you know, repetition. And then by the sixth or seventh conversation, I'd start to understand a little bit about, you know, hydrogeology, movement of groundwater, things like that. So it's really just about, you know, doing it and being curious and being willing to have those conversations with the scientists and not being afraid to ask them to put it into layman's terms, right? Put that in plain English for me so that I can explain it to somebody else. And that's a, you know, I think that's a, a the best way ultimately to learn this stuff is just to be willing to ask that question. From a uh, public utility um attorney perspective, uh, since I knew I wanted to work with utilities, I took accounting for lawyers um, because from my co-op, um, I, I co-opt at Post and Shell and they're outside counsel. George, I'm so sorry. Um, 
their outside counsel for um, the utilities in Pencil for some utilities in Pennsylvania. So um, I knew from my, my internship that we were going to be dealing with a lot of financial statements and numbers um, because, like I said, it's the business side of utilities that's being regulated. So that was a really great class. Um, I'll echo Bobby. Um, administrative law was was extremely, extremely fascinating class, but it, it was so helpful if you're going to be going into administrative law. Um, actually, I do. I feel like a lot of uh, constitutional constitutional law comes up in many of my cases because of the regulation of businesses um, and uh, tax classes as well, um, because again, businesses. So I would recommend those classes. They're actually, so administrative law, I'm gonna third what everyone said there. Um, and also there was actually a utility law um, class when I went to Drexel, um, which I happened to work out because it lined up with my career that I eventually went down. Um, and then also, I mean, um, if you're curious about going into only pub or going into policy or want to get that additional background, getting your public policy degree at the same time, or maybe seeing about taking um, internships that aren't so focused on attorney or litigation, like I interned for um, a PAC one time um, one cycle to learn about what it was like to advocate on that side. I also interned for a lobbying firm. And then um, I interned for um, the Public Interest Network. Um, and then also to jump back to Diana's suggestion with the Delaware, the Inn of Court, um, I met the Clean Air Council attorneys to the Inn of Court and have been friends with them since I met them at the Inn of Court. And they actually helped me get my previous job. They knew about it um, and suggested me. And then the job I have now was actually because I ran a advocate working group, I met the organization I work with now and they heard about me because of how my work in that group. So um, don't be afraid to put yourself out there a little bit and also like use the internships and opportunities you have here because they can really help you um, once you're out of Drexel. So I'll stop there for now and we can go to other questions. Yeah, one of the other questions was a good question. If there's an area of the law in your practice as an environmental practitioner that you didn't expect you needed to know about. And I think some of us have touched on this when Laura said something about tax or business corporations. I mean, I, I would say um, anything about what a business is, business corps or, or whatever that is called now at, at Drexel, um, if you're gonna represent either, if you're gonna be on the um, regulatory side and you're gonna be enforcing against a business and coming up with regulations or you're representing the regulated community, um, knowing what a partnership is and limited liability company and what that means for liability. And I mean, I, every single lawsuit I, I defend, I'm having to figure out what the heck this corporation is or who it is or what partnership it is. And so things like that um, don't go away. So there's sort of general uh, concepts of, of all legal fields, like your 1L contracts class. Can't tell you how many cases I have that I'm representing a client who's sort of a traditional environmental client that you could think of the alphabet suit of environmental companies. But my lawsuit's not about the environmental issue. It's about what this term in a contract said. And so, or I have a settlement agreement, you know, and I've never drafted a contract. I'm not a, I don't really do that, but I have to draft settlement agreements all the time. So sort of, you know, the basic 1L legal classes that you take, you don't throw out. I mean, you, you use them again. And so there's a lot of overlap with that, that you don't really know until you sort of in, in practice that those 1L courses you have to sort of plow through, you're going to use them later, even though if you think you won't. <laughs> business okay. orgs, that's what it's called. Sorry, I knew it's corporate something. <laughs> that's what it's the law school. That's what it's called. Yeah, so I'm going to jump in on this for, for just one second, because a lot of people ask me about classes. I do a lot of advising on what classes to take. And the panelists have, you know, talked about the kinds of classes that really are core classes. Um, but, you know, biz orgs, tax, right? These are, are, you know, almost fundamental classes. No matter what you end up doing in practice, you should know, right, what a business organization is. You should understand sort of tax consequences um, uh, of, you know, decisions that you're going to be dealing with. Tax used to actually be required probably when Donna and I went to law school, right? It was a, a requirement in a lot of law schools back then. Um, and so what I would say to students is, you know, there are a lot of courses out there that, you know, might just sort of be basic building block courses. 
And I'm not going to take anything away from my colleagues at, you know, special environmental law schools, specialty environmental law schools like Vermont Law School or Pace Law School or Lewis and Clark. You know, they offer 50 different courses on the Clean Water Act. But when, you know, push comes to shove, you take a, a set curriculum in your first year of law school. And then in your second year of law school, you've got to take a lot of these fundamental courses. You've got to take professional responsibility. You need to take biz orgs, et cetera, et cetera. By the time you're done with three years, you don't really have a lot of like free space for any number of environmental electives. To be a really good environmental lawyer, you've got to have rounded knowledge of the law and you've got to know how to be a good lawyer, right? Um, and so you really don't need to take those 50 classes on the Clean Water Act in order to be an incredibly successful environmental lawyer. So I'm going to, anybody else want to jump in on any of this or I can move us forward? Do we have more questions? There's too much to keep uh, track of. Let's go. No, we're good. Keep I going. can second that. <laughs> I, I would say one interesting class that pops up more often than I anticipated, and there's actually a dedicated person at DEP for this, is bankruptcy. Uh, oh, yeah. There's, Echo. <laughs> it, it, uh, in you know, depending on the transaction, you could have a company that owned a tank farm, went bankrupt, has environmental liabilities associated with it, and now you have to argue whether those environmental liabilities were discharged in bankruptcy, right, as part of the real estate transaction. And that's actually pretty common if you're in the real estate side of it. So again, I'll jump in on that. Because of that, I actually ended up teaching the course in secure transactions and I still do at the law school um, because I ran into bankruptcies a lot when I was practicing environmental law. Um, and now it's also on the uniform bar. And so there are a number of reasons for taking courses like that as well. So I'm gonna move us on, all right? Each of our panelists, you've all found your way to your jobs in different ways. Um, Diana early on mentioned sort of, you know, the direct path, right? I think for the rest of you, there's been a little bit more of a zigzag path. I again, talk with students about this a lot, right? Um, your first job out of law school is very rarely, um, Diana to the contrary, is very rarely your last, right? What I often tell my students is, you're gonna get out of law school in five, seven years from now, you're gonna look back from a wonderful position and the way you got there is gonna be zoom, zoom, zoom. And you're not gonna be able to write to forecast how it's going to happen, but you're gonna be really happy where you are. And I'd like the panelists maybe to talk a little bit about how they got where they are, right? And the process they went through. So I'll leave it to you all. Yeah, I'm the dinosaur, so I'm not as useful. I, I I go I went to the 1960s model of graduating and staying at a firm forever. So someone else should okay. do this one. <laughs> um, so I knew that I wanted to be in nonprofit environmental law. Um, I actually would probably consider myself a sellout if I was looking at myself five years ago when I was trying to project into the future what I would do with my career, but I think I understand the way things work a lot better now. Um, <laughs> but um, it was kind of, I think you have to be open to different ways to go down the career path and just kind of know what makes, like what makes you, I'm gonna sound corny because I've been reading a lot of self-improvement books, but what you really wanna do and what kind of makes you happy at the end of the day. Um, it took me, I think six months to get the job at the Delaware Riverkeeper Network. Um, and I did many job applications every single day, um, but that job was also really great and a rare opportunity. Uh, nonprofits don't hire that often. So if you wanna do that, I'm just gonna give you the cold hard truth right now. It might take a while to get into them. Um, and then kind of like what Professor Dean Geisinger said, um, you ping pong and then you wind up at this really great job um, and you don't really know how you got here. Um, and I would say that's kind of how I feel about my job right now, still in the honeymoon phase, three months in. Um, but it's been a lot of getting, I got a job at the Delaware Riverkeeper Network. They weren't really sure what I was going to do in the role, but I helped the attorneys out a lot. I helped the scientists write comments out a lot. And I kind of fleshed my role out there. Um, I was able to have my connection with Clean Air Council tell me about 
this role with the trade association and the trade association that I went to work at decided to expand into New Jersey. Um, there was an opportunity to be involved in forming their energy efficiency programs from the ground up. And I decided to be the advocate that harnessed all the other advocates, as I call them, the wildcats, um, put ideas up on the board for everyone to go around when the cat shows up. <laughs> um, and it was really the law degree that helped me be so, I think, capable and confident in forming the con comments and recognizing how to articulate like the needs of advocates in a way that it worked in the environment we were in. Um, and then I heard about this job and I, I had to give, I knew about the people that worked here, um, but I had to give a presentation for this job and they're like, we want you to pick an idea in a state and um, give us a 10 minute presentation on why this policy track is the best way to go. And I kind of made a decision, I really wanted this job. So I picked a state I knew nothing about. I picked something that was really close to home though in the policy idea and I researched it and I showed them what I could do if they just gave me an idea and let me run. And that's how I got the job. So that's another way to really put yourself out there but it really helps to be confident and. And being a lawyer, you are you are very capable and you know what you're doing. So I'll say that. As I said, I did my summer co-op at Post and Shell in their um, energy and utility group. And um, my experience there, we the agency that I worked for, they were a party to almost every proceeding that we were in. Um, and the attorneys that I met through my co-op, um, when I spoke to them after um, the co-op, when I started my job search, um, they all recommended this agency. Um, by the way, um, the first thing I did when I was searching for a job after that summer was make an appointment with Dean Garrison <laughs> at the Career Services Office. Um, they are extremely helpful. It, it's I compare it to like a counseling session. You go there, you explain your background, um, your interests, uh, who you know, who you might think about reach, reaching out to. Um, and I also went to meet um, Professor Geisinger. And it's funny that Diana and Bobby are both on this panel because I spoke to both of them um, to talk about their careers. Um, I told them I wanted to work with utilities and they each connected me with somebody who worked in my area of law. Um, so it's that's a great thing about Drexel is it's a really tight knit community and everybody is really willing to to help you out and give you advice. Um, and so uh, I applied to my agency after a lot of people recommended it and I got the job and I'm really happy here. So it was it was a pretty great process, but um, definitely, you know, take some stress off of you yourself and go see Dean Garrison because she's she's extremely helpful. And my 2L summer interned through the uh, the state uh, office of general counsel's um, summer internship program at DEP headquarters in Harrisburg, and I, I really enjoyed it. And, uh, you know, the market wasn't great at the time. So I thought to myself, well, in Harrisburg, there's two law schools, it's Dickinson and Widener. And then Philadelphia, there's more law schools. So in terms of competition for internships and jobs, I figured Harrisburg might be a little bit easier. And it turned out to be true. There was only one other intern in the office. So I was able to get a lot of exposure with, I think, you know, the 12 or so attorneys in the office. And I really enjoyed it. And so I then I figured I would take a leap to Harrisburg um, when a job opened up there uh, after I graduated. And so you know, getting to back to the idea of, you know, flexibility uh, and where you start your job. Um, I started in a regional office in Harrisburg and I moved out to Harrisburg and that lasted about a year and a half. And then uh, several positions opened up in the Norristown office. So I was able to then come back to Philadelphia for about three years. So I think it's a uh, it's an it's an acknowledgement that you know these are the positions available. This is where environmental law is practiced, right? It's if you want to work for the state, there's the regional offices, um, and six regional offices throughout the state. If you want to work for the federal government, there's you know the offices in Philadelphia. But uh, you know think about it from that perspective and be willing to take a leap for a couple of years and maybe go to a part of the state or a, a different state. Um, where you weren't, you know, you wouldn't think about starting your practice because, 
once you get that experience and word gets out that you're a capable uh, young attorney who's you know fluent in, in environmental law and, and has some litigation skills, there will be um, demand for your services and wherever whatever city you want to end up in. You know, I think uh, obviously patience is a part of that, but I think you know being flexible and starting. I will say I was initially contemplating a clerkship out in uh, Erie, which might have been a little bit too far for my comfort, but Harrisburg was <laughs> much more comfortable. But yeah, be definitely, you know, be open to different locations uh, and starting there because, you know, if you do it and you start it and you enjoy it, I think you'll be surprised. One, you might not, you might actually want to stay there. And two, that opportunities will find you in other areas. So one thing to, um, and I'll answer a question that came up and also to echo, because um, I'm experiencing this is sort of <laughs> on the other side where I'm trying to hire people all the time now. Um, the environmental legal community, most of them are old. And I mean that as an opportunity for young people on this call and myself and the panelists. Um, most of the people who became environmental lawyers became environmental lawyers in the early 80s when sort of the alphabet soup of environmental regulations commenced. And they're my partners, the founding partners of the firm, and they're sort of colleagues. We're finding that in private practice, there's not enough young people, um, and people who, and there's, and that is um, a huge amount of opportunities for people who want to go into environmental law and think it's a good career. Because I am desperately trying to find, and I, Professor Geisinger, I always tell him every time I talk to him, I'm like, I need more associates um, because people who may be at, and, and Bobby is a perfect example. You know, at his firm, there may be three or four people, and they probably need help, and so. Um, the generation that started the environmental bar is sort of retired um, or in their 60s and, and there's not a huge gap then to the people in their 30s or you know 20s. And so I've been you know really excited that there's a huge opportunity for people who are interested in this practice want to build their legal career because there's just not a lot of people out there that are focused on this as their career. And so I'm like always desperately trying to find people with any type of experience. Um, Someone asked a question about whether the Drexel co-op program gave you a leg up to try to um, get a job in this field. And I think, yeah, I mean, all of us co-opt, I think most of us co-opt or did an internship in an environmental or um, public sector job that while maybe led to a job or was a client or something and anything, this gives you practical experience. I think Aaron um, or someone else commented about being able to talk to a client and understand their, their perspective. Doing any of that while in law school is just yet another opportunity for you to put on your resume. That's a really meaningful opportunity for an employer, which is the shoes I'm in now. Um, you've had real experience, real hours. You're not just like dipping your toe in and being there five hours a week. You, you're spending a lot of time there. And it just gives you this intangible skill set that sort of is the life of the lawyer that back in the 1800s as an apprenticeship, where you're trying to learn how to practice law, you learn in real life. And so you learn all the theory in the classroom, but the co-ops and experiential learning with clinics and the like, whatever they're in, even if it's in an area that's not associated with environmental law, that practical experience that you get at Drexel is invaluable um, and something that's very unique to Drexel as compared to other law schools. Thank you all for being here this evening. Um, definitely really appreciate all of the different um, insight. So I didn't know how to word this question in the chat. That's why I wanted to ask. So um, I think, Bobby, you just briefly mentioned how you were considering a clerkship um, but then didn't end up going that route. And it, it didn't sound like any of you had had that experience because it sounds like with um, environmental being more administrative law, it doesn't necessarily track. Is that something um, you would recommend for, you know, for 3Ls that are still job searching that are, you know, maybe looking at the clerkship route or would you say maybe just keep applying through the summer, you know, and it would be more beneficial to start an environmental just you know kind of how would you weigh the, the benefit of a clerkship in an administrative law field any yeah clerkship is the uh, beyond valuable experience if you can get it i mean that we're you know we've been talking about just really working on your fundamentals uh reading writing and analysis and and any experience doing that will make you a better environmental attorney I was thinking in, in particular of a, a clerkship for, it's called the Environmental Hearing Board, which is the Administrative Hearing Board uh, that Diana and I often practice in front of. Um, but I would not limit consideration to just the Environmental Hearing Board. 
you know, the Commonwealth Court often gets uh, environmental issues in front of it and, you know, land use zoning issues, which are kind of part and parcel. They're not, you know, they're different substantively, but I think similar in administrative law, you know, if you can get a clerkship with the PA Supreme Court, I have colleagues or former colleagues who did that and it's, you know, fantastic training. So, yeah, that's certainly not something that, you um, you should be, you should exclude from your list of opportunities. Right. And, and while um, environmental law does have a lot, a lot of heavy administrative, I mean, 90% of what I do is litigation. And so um, I, I did a summer clerkship for a federal court judge who's now on the third circuit, but any type of legal writing and analysis and that skill set, now that I'm sort of on the employer side and looking for good candidates, huge plus. Um, while none of us did that, my colleagues at the firm did, some of my partners did, it's totally a good thing, not a negative at all. Oh, and I just wanted to add a plug. Um, any kind of, I mean, clerkships are good. Anything where you can really work on your writing um, because environmental law is really taking a complex wonky issue and trying to tell a story with it. And I'm still trying to find better ways to write every day. So any experience in that realm is good. Like Bobby said, a lot of our cases do make it to the Commonwealth Court. Um, I worked on a case before the Supreme Pennsylvania Supreme Court this year too. So, so if you do clerk, um, you might come across some cases that are in this area, so. Uh, and, and to what Diana said, sometimes half the battle is figuring out what the rules of civil procedure say and what exactly it is you're supposed to file and with what supporting documents that takes more time <laughs> than we'd like to admit sometimes, but. I think we've all had the experience, you know, I go back to one where um, I was doing an administrative appeal and there was some really wonky language in a statute about, you know, who had to be served and, uh, and the party taking the appeal didn't serve one of the parties the proper way. And because that's jurisdictional, we got out of a case simply because, you know, I had an inkling to go look at the procedure and to really sort of dig into it to get a sense of how it worked. So. Um, so I think we're at time, are we? We have five minutes. We've got five minutes. So yeah, all right. Any more questions from all of you? I'd really like to hear, right, if we have anything outstanding, um, anything you know, in there? One great question that we can always end with, if there aren't any other questions, is that what I'd love to pose to graduates, because you're older and you're wiser now, so what advice would you give to your 1L self? So I would say, <laughs> I can um, go. I can go. So, so two things that Drexel has in space, if I could tell myself as a 1L, um, be tenacious and be entrepreneurial. And so I think you've heard from some of us of how sort of, again, I'm the not good example of this for how I started my career, but in real life now, um, being tenacious and having an entrepreneurial spirit is going to give you such dividends in spades. Um, you know, I, I, I talk about, I work for a partner at the smallest little large firm <laughs> um, that does environmental law. We only eat what we kill. And I go out every day trying to find new matters and new business. And so that sort of spirit and being tenacious um, is going to get you a job. It's going to keep your job. It's going to make you, you successful in that job. Um, and sort of, I went to law school in the bottom of the 2008 recession. And so I know you guys are probably looking around saying, oh my gosh, COVID is just like a very weird time to be starting law school or finishing law school, it's never a good time. And so being tenacious and entrepreneurial and figuring out what you want to do and how that, you know, look at five to seven years from now and where do you want to be and how am I going to get there and making a plan for that is something I didn't think about as a 1L and I got lucky, but not everybody gets lucky. And so you should really think about that and, and plan your goals and, and think about how you're going to get there down, down that zigzag path that uh, Professor Geisinger talked about. Just be open to new experiences. Uh, I had no concept of environmental law when I became, when I was a 1L student, right? I, you know, kind of lucked into DEP as a 2L intern, never heard of administrative law in my life before taking it as a 2L. And I just, I liked it. And the real secret, I think, to me enjoying my career is that I just pursued the things that I found interesting. And um, that, you know, I think being a lawyer can be stressful enough so that 
you know, if you actually do something you enjoy, if you pursue something you enjoy, that's going to help you on those days where it's just, you know, slogging through and hard and, and, and it's stressful. And so that's what I would tell myself is I, you know, I, luckily I took some things that I did find interesting, but I would have been even more open to it. I think I would have tried, you know, something trial related rather than assuming I was just going to be an entrepreneurial, whatever, right. Whatever that meant to me 10 years ago. But so. I would say, I know this is a weird time for you to be networking, but um, I was always pretty terrified of the word networking um, until I got some great advice, um, which is, you know, just have conversations with people, go out and talk to people, ask them for things. The worst they could say is no. Um, and you might not even get anything out of the conversation, but go out, talk to people, meet them. Um, it's really paid off for me um, personally. So um, yeah, definitely don't be afraid to get out there and network and go to events. Don't be afraid to take advantage of opportunities that might seem a little scary, whether that's classes that you've heard are hard, internships or co-ops that you think you might not be able to even be at the top of the pile of, um, or asking to network. Um, and always be open to asking questions and admitting when you don't know things, because you can always learn. Um, and I, and embracing that is, is good to do early on. So there was one final question about, uh, I think it was undergraduate, um, uh, let me see if I can find undergraduate opportunities to gain exposure. Um, I think that really is very sort of, you know, particular to each individual school, in individual school or uh, program that you're in. But, you know, playing off of what Bobby said before, he was a Spanish major, I was a cultural historian, right? Um, I don't think, um, you know, you have to have the experience, but I would say, um, and a number of people said this, and I really do think there's a lot to it. Um, to follow your passion. If you come to law school and you decide that this is something you wanna pursue, I'm not worried about what you have behind you, right? You'll be able to pursue it in law school and get all the knowledge and experience to let you know if it's something you wanna do um, just in the three years that you're with us. Um, and I'll close up with that, right? My information is at the top of the chat somewhere. I think other people's info is at the top of the chat as well. Um, I like to think that, you know, one of the parts of my job, um, and this includes for people who aren't even gonna come to the law school, right, is to help people figure out whether this is the right thing for them or not and how to get there. So you know where I live, you can find me on the website. Um, if you do have any further questions, um, uh, or anything else. And if you want to find one of the other panelists and you can't find them directly, um, just get in touch with me. Um, I appreciate all of you coming out and joining us. Donna, do you have anything final to add? Nope, she's done. Um, we want to thank you, Ina, um, for uh, putting all of this together. Bravo and making it all work. My computer didn't fall apart while I was doing it. So thank you very much. And, uh, and thank you to our wonderful panelists. Uh, I hope to see you all soon. Mm -hmm.